Chemistry Department, over, also over in the Arts and Science program, and have been leading or heading up or actually turning over to students, in fact, uh, a, a, a year-long light speaker series, um, uh, playfully titled uh, the Master Rolling Seminar. Uh, we've had a series of talks. This is our second one in the fall. Uh, coming up in, in April, I believe on April 1st, they we're still ironing out the details, but there'll be a, a roundtable discussion uh, on Monday, April 1st in the evening on uh, women in racing, and a subsequent one, hopefully a week after that, we're still sort of trying to nail down both uh, times, dates, and potential participants, uh, another sort of roundtable on getting more people on bikes, so not necessarily in a road and racing kind of perspective, but uh, thinking more broadly about uh, cycling and cycling culture and how it can play a part in not just the McMaster, but the larger Hamilton and urban infrastructure uh, we have going on around us. Um, one of the real pleasures of this series is being able to tie it into a couple of classes I'm teaching on bicycle and society. Uh, I've got a number of students who are doing all kinds of neat projects with the city and with various sort of community partners on campus and beyond about thinking about how to integrate bicycles uh, into everywhere we, we are and where we go. How do we, how do we make it safer for more people to ride, but in addition, how do we get more people on bikes at the same time? Um, one of the challenges I put to one of my classes was how do you transform, how do you rebrand McMaster as Bike U? Um, and there are a series of interesting projects that are loosely related to the series, but stay tuned. There'll be some, uh, some neat, neat, neat opportunities to learn a little bit about that. Uh, but today I'm really excited to uh, welcome uh, Michael Berry uh, to, to McMaster and, and to the series. Uh, Michael Berry probably doesn't need much of, a, of an introduction. Uh, has been uh, probably Canada's most uh, prominent professional uh, cyclist for the last decade or so. Um, has ridden all over the world at all the, all the major professional races in the world tour. Uh, has represented Canada on multiple occasions uh, at the Olympics. And in addition to that, uh, has has ridden with some of the well, has ridden uh, against, but also then with, of course, uh, some of the some of the biggest names in, in professional cycling. Um, today's talk is we, we thought we'd start with sort of a conversation. Um, I'm kind of interested in a whole series of issues related to uh, professional cycling, uh, his experience in cycling, but also going forward from here as well. There are a lot of really uh, we, we've had a series of really interesting uh, engagements over sort of. Uh, the Milton Velodrome and urban cycling and urban infrastructure uh, writ large. So there's a, hopefully a, a rambling conversation that we can ultimately include you in. We'll, we'll sort of turn this over to a, an extensive Q&A for people who, who, who want to participate or ask questions, we can certainly do that. Um, Michael Berry is also the author of Le Métier, uh, along with a number of other uh, titles, but this uh, this is a terrific book. Well, I, I really, I'm, I'm very fond of this book and uh, find myself returning to it regularly. Uh, which, which is exciting that Michael Barrett, Michael's not just a, uh, this sounds terrible, not just a professional cyclist, but an articulate, um, an articulate author who's thought very carefully about what it means to be uh, not just a professional cyclist, but what, what the bicycle means uh, on, on a larger scale. And, and I really value the book on, on those grounds. It's um, really, really exciting to have him here and to sort of play with some of these ideas. So welcome. Thank you very much. Without being the boring historian, maybe we can start start at the beginning. And how did you get into cycling in the first place? Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here, and it's wonderful it's wonderful to be back at McMaster. Um, I I came down here quite a bit when I was younger, and I was coached by Mirak Reserve, who lives in in Dundas, and uh, we did a lot of physical testing here. And it's just it was we went for a ride this morning. It was nice to be back on some familiar roads and in the wonderful countryside. I met some new people who are very friendly as well. So how did I get into cycling? My, um, my father, who's sitting here, he, uh, he owned a bike store in Toronto for a long time and, uh, and has been a keen cyclist since he was a teenager. He grew up in, in Wimbledon in, uh, in, in England and, uh, and started riding when he was about 14 or 15 and has been, what, less than that? Okay, 10, okay, uh, in the streets of, in the streets of, of London and, um, and he emigrated to Canada, opened a bike store, had a, had a team. And so I, I really grew up immersed in a cycling environment. Uh, from a young age, I was playing with the, the ball bearings on the floor in the, in the bike shop. Um, was always in the, in the back, bothering the mechanics and working on my bike, asking for help and that sort of thing. And really, from a, from, since I was a small boy, my, my heroes, my childhood heroes, were 
hockey players or baseball players, but pro bike racers. And uh, that was somewhat unique in the growing up in the 70s and 80s, where you know, very, very few Canadians knew much about cycling at all. Um, Steve Bauer later in the late 80s was, or mid to late 80s, was extremely successful, and uh, and he kind of brought brought cycling into the Canadian household. But still, it was, I mean, we were, uh, I think, I would say, yeah, yeah cyclists, cycling was not a, a common sport in North America. Um, but which is, it's amazing for me to come back here. I've been coming back once or twice a year. I lived in Spain for for the last 10 years, and I come back to Toronto once or twice a year, and just seeing the number of cyclists now is is remarkable to me. It's, it's cycling has it's really taken off, and uh, and having grown up in this sport, um, it's wonderful to see that you know so many more people are riding bikes now and are enjoying and commuting on their bikes and just uh, you know getting fit. Um, so you know, from a from a very young age, since I was two, three years old, uh, I already was looking at bikes. I was around bikes when I was five years old. I rode four or five years old. I guess I rode my first races, um, and my you know I was around my dad's bike team all the time. So and then and then things progressed. Uh, I did other sports in high school and, and through grade school and high school. And, uh, and when I was about 16 years old, I. I you can't remember the provincial team, and that's when I started to take it seriously. And, uh, and then from the provincial team, I became a national team member, and, and then things progressed from there. All these, I, I eventually achieved my childhood dream of becoming a professional and, and racing in Europe. And uh, in, in the races that I had read about in my father's magazines or, or watched, um, watched on film. And so that's, I mean, that's more or less it. I've lived, uh, I lived in, in France for a few years as an amateur um, when I was 20, 21, 22 years old. And, uh, and then I got married, moved to Colorado. I lived in Boulder, Colorado for on and off for 10 years, and then in Spain on and off for 10 years as well. So that's, uh, and I've raced with, um, when I was racing in France, I was racing with an amateur team just outside of, outside of Geneva right across the border um, in a town called Anmas, and I raced there for two and a half years. And, uh, and then from there, I, I had a series of injuries and, uh, and kind of stepped back, for, stepped back from European cycling and almost quit altogether and uh, came back to North America. And I ended up signing a contract with American Protein Saturn, and I raced there for, raced with them for, um, <coughs> Two and a half year, three years, and uh, and then after that, I signed with U.S. Postal, which was Lance Armstrong's team, and uh, or the team that Lance Armstrong rode for, <laughs> uh, for for uh, three years, and then Discovery Channel, which U.S. Postal became um, for two years, and then after that, I signed a contract with T-Mobile, a German team, which had been taken over by an American uh, businessman, uh, Bob Stapleton, and. Uh, and I raced, I raced with uh, with them for for three years, and then I, I just raced for Sky for the last three years. Uh, the British protein. So, this is a short summary. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you, 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 you provoked sort of 27 questions. Which basically, yeah. you know, the, re the rest of our time together, we, we could sort of draw on questions from there. I was just thinking very quickly, short 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 answer based on um, did you have a favorite race or you know a, a race that you look forward to in the annual calendar? You're right at the end of the. the the third edition of Le Métier, you sort of talk about sort of realizing this dream of riding the tour for the first time and that being a really exciting moment. But was there a was was there a race that was sort of one that you had sort of penciled or underlined as just sort of this was an opportunity, you know, you were, you were looking forward to it, whether it was opportunities to win or to do well or rather just the nature of the race or That's interesting. Like I think the races that I thought would have been my favorite races, um, perhaps in looking back now on them. They weren't necessarily. I mean, experienced them and raced in them. They weren't necessarily my favorite races for for many reasons. And uh, but when I look back on my career, probably the real highlights were um, when I was able to come back and race in Canada, and uh, and even just the last two years being able to race in Montreal and Quebec, and because that just brought back a, a flurry of 
emotions that drew me back to my childhood, and I saw all these familiar faces, and uh, and there's really nothing like racing on home soil. And sadly, like I didn't get to experience that a whole lot in my through my career. Like, uh, you know, as a professional, I probably raced in Canada after my years with Saturn ten times, if that. And uh, so, um, on a on a personal level, like those were on an emotional level, I guess, though, coming back and racing in Canada was something um, that, that all, I mean, uh, those, ex those moments uh, are dear to me now, um, looking back on my career. As far as races that, it's it, like, cycling is, the, a lot of the races, there's, um, they're extremely intense, really hard, especially the classics. They're not all that enjoyable. They're awesome when you finish. <laughs> so the best moment of Perry Roubaix is just sitting in the bus and you know covered in dirt, <laughs> sipping on a Coca Cola. You know, um, that's like there's nothing better. And I love Perry Roubaix for that moment where you can just kick back and you've accomplished something. And even you know the team's won, lost, performed well. It's been a terrible day, whatever. Sitting there on the bus, or you know in the airport or whatever on the way home, that's an awesome feeling. But that's something that everybody can experience on some level. You can go out riding with your buddies here for 200K and you get back to Chris's cafe and you sit around and you feel that same that same thing. I think on, on a personal level racing, like a race like Carrier Bay or the Tour de France for that order or the Giro d'Italia, like the, the, the racing is so intense. It, it's kind of hard to enjoy it, um, but but after that sense of accomplishment and just that that that's, that that makes those races something special, you know. Um, anyhow, I think I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I, I was just I was just saying, it was more of just novel curiosity. Was, kind of, yeah. was there a race that sort of uh, that, that, that drew you in? Well, you, you started by sort of saying that you know you were. So, I mean, you stole my fire, I and mean, I was hoping to sort of follow up with a, you know, it's weird for a Canadian to grow up passionate about cycling. Um, and, and then more to the point, even even, even more rare for the, the, the Canadian who's passionate about cycling to to make it to sort of the, the professional stage, um, just in terms of the uh, resources, general sort of popular acceptance of opportunities to ride and race here as opposed to Europe and other places. Like, and at what point was it? I mean, you sort of mentioned sort of coming home from France and then starting out with it, you know, taking a break and starting with America. What, I mean, tell me about the progression sort of becoming a professional. I mean, on the one hand, this is a childhood sort of dream and notion and, and, and plan, but at the same time, became, at what point does it become a reality in ways that you sort of thought that this is. Uh, um, it was very kind of long progression to get to the point where, and I, I, I there were several points where. I I thought it was over in a sense, whether it was with crashes or just um, you know emotional experience, whatever things that I went through uh, throughout my that that initial phase of my career. When I moved to France, it was extremely difficult. I initially went over there with uh, well, moving back, going backwards a bit. Um, the national team coach at the time, Denis Rue. He, uh, he was a Frenchman, and uh, he, he, he had been a professional cyclist, had a lot of contacts in France. And in the fall of 1995, um, he called me up and he said, listen, would you like to race as an amateur in France? There are three clubs that will, three clubs that will take you. They'll uh, provide you with accommodation and food, and, uh, and then you, you know, get you to the races and support you in that sense. Um, so, <coughs> He said one is in you know one is in uh, Tar, which was down in the south of or is down in the south of France and uh, and you know, in the Pyrenees and the other the other club was in Rennes and uh, and then the third club was in Nantes and so I knew I knew where Tar was and I knew where Rennes was and one of my one of the other national team teammates had been in in, uh, in Tar and he had a pretty horrendous experience down there so I kind of just. After hearing his experiences, I said, all right, I'm not going to go there. Um, I had raced in Rennes, and I wasn't a big fan of the crosswinds or the cold weather or um, 
just the general environment there. And uh, so I looked, on, I looked, where the heck is that mass? And uh, found it on the map. It was just outside of Geneva. And I thought, well, that could be a good place to live. It's, Geneva's an international city. I could, you know, hear a little bit of English now and then, maybe. And uh, so I, I said to Denis, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but at the time, I was going to U of T. And, uh, and so I dropped out of school and decided to go and, uh, and race in France. Um, and that was, I, I went over there initially with another Canadian, and we shared an apartment. And uh, we had a really tough time of it. And went home after about six weeks, I guess, or a month. Like, and he was just extremely lonely and missed, missed Canada. And uh, for, I mean, which I, I think on some level what got me through it was the fact that I had this idyllic kind of image of France and the Tour de France and, you know, French bread and de chevaux and all these things. Like, I, I had this very romantic um, impression of it, so... Uh, you'd, you'd ridden a, a tandem bike around France. Yeah, well, that, yeah, and that had a lot to do with it. My father and I, when I was eight years old, we went to um, to France and did a tour on the tandems with my aunt and uncle. So we were on a tandem, and they were on a tandem. And uh, and we went from, well, he picked me up. I flew over with the tandem by myself. And uh, he was already over there for the bike show. So um, I think it was the bike show, or you did a tour of the bike show. Yeah. And, uh, and um, so I, he picked me up at the airport, and I, I, uh, I, I um, we, we actually rode the tandem from the airport to, yeah, the train station, Garde Lyon, I guess, and, uh, and then from there, we took the train down to um, Grenoble, and that's where we started this tour, and we rode from Grenoble to Marseille, and, uh, and it was awesome, like, and I, many times when I've been back in France racing, I've passed these points, and like, oh my gosh, I was here with my father, like, whatever, 20 years ago, you know, and I, I had these clear, clear memories of certain spots on that, on that trip, and um, that trip left a wonderful impression of France, uh, and, and uh, I mean, it was, it, when I, when, uh, as far as trips in my lifetime go, that was probably um, one of the Highlight, you know, it was uh, really fantastic, and um, anyhow, so yeah, that 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 was my my first real experience over there, and uh, collecting tubulars going up Mont Blanc too. Like, <laughs> there were people had discarded tubulars at the side of the road, and I wanted, I kept asking my dad, can we stop and keep them? <laughs> so, <laughs> I love being on my bike. For me, it was really a lot of fun. And after 
after school, I would meet up with a couple of buddies and we'd just go ride in the parks of Toronto or head up north and there was never a whole lot of structure to it. And the pressures I put on my, the, the pressure I felt um, was an internal pressure. I just, I mean, I, I wanted to, to win races and perform, like that nervousness that I felt, that was all internal. I didn't, I never was pressured by my parents or um, family to, to win bike races or they supported me through the whole time, but never did my dad say like, oh, you should probably go out and train today, you know? Never did I hear that. And then when I was 14 or 15 years old and then started, I was integrated into the provincial team and then the national team, that started to evolve and it started to, there was, at, at some point there was, I felt there was an external pressure for me to, I felt anyways, um, to, to hold that level and to do a certain amount of training and, um, and basically to stay within that team, I had to be doing what the, the training program I was assigned and that sort of thing. And, and, that, and that continued. Um, and I realized that there were all these sacrifices involved with being a cyclist and to achieve my goal, my, my childhood dreams and this, this whole passion um, that I had for cycling. I wanted to be a pro cyclist from a very young age. And uh, and I don't think I really, I, I don't think there was a point where I realized the sacrifices that I was, I had to make to get to that point um, until like I really looked back on it. And I mean, even through high school, I got to a point where all my high school friendships kind of dissolved and I became friends with my cycling mates. And my whole high school experience was totally different than a normal kid's experience. And uh, I, I, on some level, I, I don't, I, I did miss out on a chunk of high school and, and university or whatever. And But um, I also had some amazing experiences cycling and traveling through the world. And um, But but there was but there was a sacrifice involved with, with some of that. Um, I was away from my family for a lot of the time. I was, you know, I was living in France with in an apartment by myself. I would, I would see my teammates at the races. I would most of the, most of the time I was training by myself. I, you know, call my call my dad and mom on the weekends and uh, and let them know how I did in the race. I didn't have a phone in the apartment, so I didn't have a television. So my life was very kind of. I I I, I guess I, I re realized that it would take um, that that's what it was going to take to to become a professional. And there was this. And so, I mean, coaches uh, through the years, directors and all that, they really agreed in us that you, there, had, you had to have, to, there was a certain level of sacrifice, whether it was with regards to diet or training, um, that you that you had to kind of devote your life to cycling if you wanted to be. And I, and I understood that, like, over time I understood that. Uh, but, but through that period, I guess I also moved away from the feelings that I had every day when I was a kid. So there were a lot of days where I would wake up like, I don't really want to ride my bike today, but I knew that I had to to perform, right? So there was a change in that. I, I teach a, a number of classes on um, the history of quantification and how uh, we, we've sort of come to sort of accept and, and, and uh, I, I adopt data and numbers as just purely objective in a whole variety of ways. One of the things that interests me in, in is that in addition to in addition to Michael's prose, there are some stunning photographs from Camille uh, McMillan. Um, are really, I mean, the, the combination of the two are, are, are really beautiful. But in addition to that, you've got a whole bunch of power data numbers and sort of there, there's a whole bunch of sort of data and stats in there, um, which struck me as really interesting. I mean, I um, and we see even today, you know, sort of uh, amateur cyclists are strapped up to heart rate monitors or strapped up to power meters and all kinds of things. But um, you sort of mentioned sort of this almost sort of nonchalantly, this progression from provincial team to national team and into sort of this high level amateur and sort of approaching sort of pro level. At what point does sort of the data and the numbers sort of play a role? Is it just ride your bike really fast and win races? Hey, you're pretty good at this. Let's get you to the next level. At, which, at what point did that training sort of involve sort of an interest in, in just sort of the, the sheer uh, data? I mean, I'm guessing sports science on some level um, could test you and me at sort of age 17, 18 and determine that, yes, Michael, um, 
we should look into pro cycling and no Michael, um, chess might be a good idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, at what point does that sort of, I mean, when it, I, I wonder when it was. Yeah, when I was 15 years old. Oh, really? That yeah, early? Yeah, okay. that's, I mean, that for me, that was really when things, before that, I never really had a training program. I just went out and I didn't have a coach or anything. I just rode for fun. And uh, I kind of structured my training based on how I was feeling or what I thought I should be doing. And uh, I went to every race that we could find, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I did everything from cyclocross to track racing to everything, everything, and I just loved doing it. Um, but then, yeah, when I was 15 years old, I, I was tested here, and 15, 16 years old, and uh, and then my values were looked at. Then I had training programs and and training programs to follow, training programs that I was. I mean, that, that was back before we really used heart rate monitors that much, and uh, and the power meters didn't really exist, um, and so. Uh, you know, I followed these, the training programs, and then as the technology just was, as it evolved, then our training, my training programs evolved. But interestingly, like I also learned a lot about my body and a lot about training and what the rhythms of my body. And uh, and the last, the last three or four years, um, I mean, I the, just knowing the sensations and that I didn't really have to use the power meter as much, even though I was. You know, for specific intervals or workouts, then obviously I was looking at the numbers, but overall it wasn't, it didn't really mean that much to me. I was always uploading it and sending it to the team, and they would analyze it, but more or less, um, they would analyze it to know where I was physically. Uh, but but I got to a point where um, it, was, it was a good training tool, but also I knew what I needed to do to get in shape for whatever Perry Roubaix or whatever race it was, you know. Is it really peaks and valleys and you were you to be trained? Yeah, exactly. And I think over time, like when I was when I was younger, I just I would follow that training schedule, um, or the training program exactly, you know, to what it said. So if it said ride ride indoors for two hours, you know, every day of the week during the winter, I did that. And then uh, <laughs> later on with Sky, we had some amazing sports scientists, and and also just figuring out the rhythms of my body and like how important recovery was, and just being fresh mentally and physically. I started uh, taking more time off, letting my body recover properly, and then really training effectively when I was training. So I think a lot of athletes make the mistake where they um, they feel guilty if they're taking a day off or if they're doing an easy ride and they want to push all the time, and. Uh, but really, like, you need that to, to reach the, the peaks. Otherwise, you just kind of flat line all your digress. I, this is interesting to me, I'm like, as someone who doesn't race, that, I mean, I, you know, so much of racing obviously involves sort of tactical nuance, actually being smart on the bike. It's not just about who's going fastest, but rather identifying when there's a moment where one can take advantage of it. You know, an opponent's weakness or whatever to take it, you know, to, to, to take advantage of that extra strength and power and things, but um, which is harder to quantify, harder to measure, obviously, compared to sort of the the, the straight out uh, strength, endurance, what have you. Um, I just again at 15 though, identifying that clearly you were you were good at this, um, smart at this as well. But is that something that can be trained or taught, or is that just an experience based? I think I mean I had probably an advantage from a young age that I was immersed in it, so I understood the tactics and how races unfolded. And I, mean, I, I grew up understanding, you know, sitting in, in a wheel slipstream and all that. And that's that's actually like quite a complicated thing for for most people to figure out, like the pack dynamics, the, the, how the peloton flows and all that. But because I think having been on club rides from a very young age, been taught how to ride in a group from a very young age, and then also just watching every bike race that I could or reading about them in the magazines probably gave me an advantage from a young age tactically. Um, but, but presumably, yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, that's that's just what I would guess, but I don't know what the other yeah, guy yeah, experiences. Yeah. Probably, was, but, but presumably, from a, from a coach's or from a team's perspective, um, physical abilities is, is, is the most obvious way to reduce margins for error and things like that, to sort of maximize potential that's based on just the physical endurance or ability. Yes, and no, I, 
mean, it, it's interesting because um, be, cycling, what makes cycling such a great sport, it's really hard to predict the winners for the most part. Um, cycling is cycling has evolved to the point now where maybe it is becoming more predictable, but uh, just because of the well, that's that's another story. But so, 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 let's come back to that. The uh, the um, uh, what that like. It, it isn't always the strongest guy that wins a bike race, and uh, or in a lot of other sports that the strongest person usually does win. Where cycling is, I mean, there's this cliche that cycling is chess on bikes, and it very much is. There are a lot of tactical games that are played there before and after the races, uh, before, during, and you know after the race. Like it's it's just this, um, and you're and you're playing with all these different variables as well. Uh, it's not a close environment, so all those variables have to be taken into account. And at the end of the day, I've raced with guys that are just beasts physically, and, uh, and they're not that good in the races. They don't get results, you know. And uh, a, a, a good example of the opposite is Mark Cavendish, who ta- physically he's not that talented. In fact, when we were, the first year we were on Z Mobile, um, he was a Neo Pro there. And, uh, they wanted to, the team wanted to get rid of him after they did the physical testing. They basically tried to break his contract and get rid of him. The coaches were, and well, some of the coaches wanted to, you know, the, because they saw these numbers and they're like, this guy is not even the level of a cycle tourist, you know. And uh, he basically, they had, they, 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 no, no, that's, that's what they told us. The, the coach on the team said, your, your, your levels are, you need to perform like a cycle tour. And, uh, and they, they did this thing that was basically um, they, they graphed all, all these different parameters of each each um, rider on the team, and they put it in a bullseye. And if you were a rider who who basically had I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this out, but um, a rider who who had a graph that went all the way around the outside of the bullseye was extremely like well-rounded and probably a Grand Tour winner. A rider who had the line this circle the middle of the bullseye is useless, right? And Marks went it was like almost all around the bullseye except he had this peak of peak power, which was like off the charts. But the rest of it was and and Mark was a young kid, I think he was like twenty one or twenty two at the time. He was just pretty upset about all this. And a week later at the first race of the year he came within, you know, centimeters of winning it. And uh, and then he won thirteen races that year. Just shows you like physical. He had he had one strength, but he could get through these the races and uh, perform extremely well just based on that one strength. Even though a lot of people were And that's that's a, that's a mentality thing as, as much as anything. The capacity to suffer, the, the ability to yeah, and, uh, and and not to say he doesn't work hard, but again, the data, the science. I mean, so I know like I know Mark fairly well. He works extremely hard. He can suffer like a dog, and uh, he knows his strengths. He knows his weaknesses, and, um, and but he comes across as supremely confident at the same time. time. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's. I mean, yeah, he's. he's uh, he comes across as really confident, but it's interesting. Like when you're there, he has a persona in the in the public persona that's very kind of different than what we experience at the dinner table or in the room with him sharing rooms and that and he's extremely considerate and just uh, not that confident people aren't considerate but he's like he comes across kind of as this brash arrogant kid sometimes in the media and that's I think that's his sprinter persona and when he's interviewed as he crosses the line that's his it's that, much adrenaline that, that's all everything wrapped up in that those you know final 10 kilometers and he's kind of released in the last two minutes and you put a microphone in front of him and it's not a good still buzzy <laughs> but, uh, but he is like he's uh He's, he's a really nice kid, and he's um, or man, no, I guess, <laughs> and uh, he's uh, he's very considerate of his teammates, and uh, I mean, the kind of guy that we would uh, just uh, share rooms with him. I mean, you share rooms with people, you get to know them very well, and, and uh, he's very thoughtful. Well, tell me about the teammate. I mean, I, I'm 
I was fascinated with sort of the scene behind, you know, behind the racing, as it were. I mean, you, you mentioned the dinner table and teammates, and um, you've spoken very warmly about a bunch of teammates uh, on this morning's ride and things, and sort of this, this sharing of a, um, well, I wouldn't be but I mean, also of a, 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 a passion as well, whether it's any, during the season or during the off season, but there's a, a place at the dinner table for conversation, the lobby is a place to, or was a place to hang out, yeah. um, you know, post post stage or post race as, as a means of just sort of being able to, to socialize, which in a lot of ways is the opposite of the um, the, the empty apartment we were discussing in here, yeah. suggesting that, that last, there was a, a place of sort of collegiality and things. And presumably that has ebbs and flows based on character and the kinds of people around you and, uh, and all kinds of things. But um, I think, uh, I mean, when in the race environment, it's coming coming back to that, you know, you're, 200k ride you might do with your buddies here is that you get back and you want to share that experience and you you experience something together that's somewhat you know extreme and uh, and that brings you closer um, and at, when you, when you experience you know when in a grand tour with with the team we become very close because we're experiencing this extreme event together or whatever race it it is really we're experiencing it together and we're helping each other through it physically and emotionally and that creates a bond but then <laughs> often when we get home it's like you want you want to leave that behind and you want to be back with your family and you want to open you know, see other things do other things um, so there 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 are these contrasts uh, and, and I think bike racing is incredibly intense where I don't I don't really think there are any other sports where you spend 24 hours a day literally with your teammates and uh, like <laughs> we room together we shower on the bus together we you know we're, we're together all the time we're racing together and, uh, and so uh, you, the race finishes and you, you need a break from that um, but then after a while that like, you, you start to miss that that feeling of camaraderie and that's probably one of the things that I'll miss the most about bike racing is just that, that feeling of camaraderie with uh, with with my my teammates or you know the built-in yeah. sort of support network. Yeah. Sort of, I don't think it's not support. I support something. Yeah, right. no, no, it's, it's just, just like yeah, it. like okay. friendships built yeah. on experience. You know? yeah. But through sort of a mutual experience, mutual successes and failures, but also just sort of a, a, a shared passion on, on the bicycle yeah. itself. So. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And that chance, there was, that, that was very different with different groups of guys I was with. Some I didn't, I didn't really enjoy being with at all. Some teams were more difficult than others. Some, you know, uh, but I would say like in the last couple of years, maybe it was as I matured as well, like I, I came to enjoy it a whole lot. You obviously changing teams, race with a lot of people at different stages. Um, uh, different stages of their careers and yours and, and, and things. But there seems to be one of the things that struck me in the MHA was a series of, uh, of <coughs> photographs of you on training rides with the first thing that sort of made me sort of take note again as a total outsider was that you were, I mean there were endless sort of cafe shots of you with four or five different guys from totally different teams that, you know, obviously uh, mostly North American, not exclusively, but mainly North Americans. Um, but uh, all wearing sort of Different team jerseys or different bike or whatever, and I just sort of was curious as to how that. I mean, you know, we, we think of um, obviously there's, there's a degree of, uh, a, 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 of a larger sort of sporting mentality in any kind of competition that one ha has to have respect for opponents and things like that. But there's something sort of curious that these weren't the teammates. This one, you know, in terms of that camaraderie, obviously in race that matters, but off season, they're guys you must be seen on a daily basis in, in the races you're racing against them, but the yeah, uh, cycling is very unique in that way where uh, you do train with your rivals. And, uh, and I mean, I, I was living in Spain. Um, I, I had, we had a group of, there are 60 professionals living in Girona now, roughly. Maybe more, maybe 70 this year. And uh, so guys from Australia, all over the world really now. Pretty much all the foreigners have gone there in the last 10 years. And, uh, and um, but I, I generally train with six to eight guys um, that I got along well with, and uh, we 
have some good conversations and that. But I mean, all, really, all through my career, I trained with guys that I would compete against on the weekend. You know, and, uh, but I don't know. That's just I think the way cycling is and the way it's always been. Uh, you would never get two football teams practicing no, soccer just teams practicing us, together. Let's go kick a ball around. But, no, that's um, not but you know, cycling's a little bit unique because I don't think there are any real secrets that are. Problem is. 
is when when you're in when the athlete's in the environment um, and working towards a goal. Uh, you know, we're as good as yesterday's performance, and tomorrow's performance means everything in a sense. You know, and that's athletes have a hard time looking a year down the road, and especially in a sport like cycling, where most teams are a liability because they they rely on sponsorship dollars and very few teams have contracts that are more than a year or two um, long with their sponsors and then what kind of job security do you have as a cyclist I mean if you if you crash I mean serious crash and you're done for the season is there a what I mean there are most <laughs> most most it depends on the contract and the team really um, I think most teams you would hope would pay the rider through the rest of the season, but I think if they're out of, as a, I mean, I've had contracts where if you're you're not racing for six months, then they can. Like, so it depends on it depends on the contract and the situation. And, um, but there but there isn't a whole lot of job security for cyclists. Our contracts were most contracts are a year, or two years. Some riders sign for three or four, but it's very rare. And uh, and and there's. For that reason, I mean, there's this just this, this constant pressure for for the teams to produce results. Every race counts, more or less, and it, it, a lot of that comes back to the point system and just the complete structure of the sport. And uh, but these issues aren't unique to cycling at all, I don't think. Um, but you seem to suggest that, it's getting more dangerous. Yeah. And, and and I think we can sort of suggest that well, hockey, football, whatever is is getting faster, and you know. Maybe we can sort of see an increased degree of dangers, but is it just the speed that's changed? You sort of suggest there are more crashes. There's more as well. If you look at um, certainly cycling, the speeds are higher now. The equipment's changed. The, there, there, are, there are several factors that I think have have, um, <coughs> have contributed to the increase in crashes in cycling. One is probably the um, just the change. Well, one is the, the the change in the infrastructure of European cities and uh, and where you have. When I first moved, when I was racing in, in Atlas, there were a few roundabouts. Um, that was in '95. Uh, that more or less, there you know there were there wasn't we call them road furniture, um, just the the planters, the pylons, all that stuff. And if you watch, if you watching the Tour de France or any Amstel World Race or any of these races, there the riders are constantly. Um, moving around this stuff, we're slamming straight into it. And from television, from from the can, like watching a race on television, you can't, you don't see the chaos in the peloton. You can't, you can't feel that chaos. Um, sometimes it just looks like the peloton's cruising along, everybody's moving along together, and they come towards, you know, whatever Gerard's Bergen, and they go up the climb, and, or whatever. You know, it, it looks, it, it looks very kind of tame. But then when you're in the middle of that, it's extremely intense. And you're more or less, you know, every 30 seconds you're avoiding a crash or you're, it, it's, it, it's stressful. Um, There's something else aesthetically you, you pleasing as people go around the Yeah, it's like beautiful on TV, you yeah. know, it's like, I, Not so much. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but when you're in the middle of that, it's, you're, you're constantly, you're, you're aware of everything that's going, you're trying to figure out where your teammates are. You're pushing to the front because you have to be at the front of the peloton to avoid crashes and to be there for when it does split up if their riders attack and that sort of thing. So but whenever uh, trying to be at the front at the same time. So. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you have basically, I think the radios are, have contributed to it as well, where in that push towards um, for, for everybody to get to the front, there's now, you know, we're all listening, we're all, we all these radios in our ears and the directors are saying, get to the front, get to the front. Well, that's fine if there are, he's telling eight guys that, but you have, 22 directors telling their, their riders the same thing, and suddenly you have 200 riders trying to get to the front, and there are bottlenecks and crashes, and uh, and then also when you hear a command, get to the front, get to the front, get to the front, well, inside you're like, all right, I've got to get to the front, and so you take more risk to, to do that, and as a result, there are more crashes. Um, I think uh, there's, the cycling has changed in the sense that now, um, like like hockey, like so many other sports, there you're drawing from an international pool of athletes. Whereas 15, 20 years ago, it, it was more or less a continental pool of athletes. So now um, it's most.
the sport to become global. And, uh, and that obviously increases the overall level. There are less discrepancies between, between riders. The peloton doesn't split up nearly as easily as it once did. If you look at images from <laughs> Milan San Remo is a great example. Uh, Milan San Remo in, in 1992-93, those, those years, like there were ones and twos going over the Chipress and the Poggio in the final, you know? And now, almost every year, it's like, they're gonna be, you know, they're, they're coming into the Poggio, there are 40, 50, 60s, and into the Chipress, so there are over 100 guys. And, uh, and crashes happen. It's just, you know, you, you can't fit 100 guys down a three meter road without <laughs> something happening, right? So, um, that's, uh, that, that's another factor. Um, I think, uh, well, overall, I mean, just the fact that in cycling now, again, 50, 20 years ago, you would have the top 10 result sheets and stuff. And, and really, it only mattered if, to a team, like nothing after 10th place mattered that much, or to the riders, it didn't matter that much. Whereas now, there's, there's a lot more value, whether, you know, for, for a young rider who's from some small town north, he gets 35th place, that's a great result. Whereas before, it didn't matter. So you have guys racing for, more guys racing for more places, and that changes the race dynamic as well. So where the majority of the peloton would basically sort of ease, ease up yeah. when uh, every, everyone's still racing. Yeah, and like that, the only real places that had a lot of value were everybody raced with the leader, and that was it. Whereas now, you have, uh, Level you have the riders race for the leader, but then they can continue to race for their own place as well. Um, and that's, uh, so that's changed the way the race is so, that, you know, I think that's contributed to the increase in crashes as well. Uh, so those are, those are some of the main, the main factors. Um, I think probably there are some, you know, like the equipment should be looked at as well. And we have like, the wheels are extremely fast now. Braking surfaces aren't that great. Good um, equipment snaps pretty quickly. Uh, so those are, <coughs> the crashes are the crashes are bad. Now guys break a lot of bones. And, uh, I've broken a lot of bones, but I mean, most races, if you look at the at, at, in the result sheets that they hand out to the teams after the race, there's a communicate. And most days, like there are some pretty serious injuries, broken bones, or whatever. You know, so, um, that's. Those things should be identified, and I don't know. I mean, these are, I'm guessing, on all these issues, but they should be looked at, you know? I mean, these are people, we're, the athletes are risking their lives, and people have died in bike races, and no one's questioning this. And in the Giro a couple years, like, a couple years ago, which a whale had died on the stage, but it was just people say, well, that's bike racing. But as, I don't think we should accept that. I, I mean, it's not, like, that's not, Okay, we accept risk as athletes, but um, as a parent, like, should we accept that, right? Or as a friend, or whatever. Those are the people, like, uh, that that should really be questioned. Well, your, your criticism has been too pronged in a lot of ways. On the one hand, sort of making it clear to a larger public that, from a management perspective, we need to rethink. Okay, routes so that we're avoiding roundabouts as much as possible, so we can. Sort of Make sure that the route is as safe as possible, but also talking uh, a two-pronged approach in terms of talking to you know, talking to your fellow cyclists at the same time. That on the one hand, uh, we, we need to take greater responsibility for ensuring that we're riding in safer safer races, which involves sort of almost a sort of a, 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 a union sort of level sort of level of agreement that there are safety standards that we need to be adhering to, but also that sort of a mutual sense of respect as well. That <coughs> finishing 35th isn't worth it if we're if we're then I mean you know. Other oh, yeah. our workmates I think that overall that's... there's just a whole lot less respect in, in the Peloton. Um, there's, and I don't, I don't know why that has happened, but I, I don't think it's really that unique to cycling. Um, and where um, there's, there's just riders do things now that they didn't do ten years ago, and uh, and there isn't necessarily the same hierarchy there's not before there was quite often one rider that would put everybody in hey, calm down let's take it easy this part of this section of course is dangerous we're going to go easy through here get through it and then we're going to race you know and sort of a patron of the peloton bernard you know, was, was famous for that um and and there isn't really by anybody who is really there the riders didn't have a voice um and they didn't uh they didn't have a, they don't have a 
representation, but they don't have strong representation. And that needs to change. How, how do you fabricate that? Or how do you? I, I think it's quite easy. A lot of other sports, um, a lot of other sports have it, but uh, um, it's just setting up an independent structure. And it's been talked about a lot of cycling, but that it's, it's difficult. The one problem with cycling is you don't you don't have a league like many other sports. That's kind of concrete. And cycling is very fractured, where you have all these different levels and teams that are racing together. So different countries, nationalities, and they're all under um, under the UCI, but they're all kind of fighting to survive within that structure. So there's not a whole lot of solidarity, and it comes back to this: these teams being more or less liabilities, you know, where they're not they're, um, they're, there's not a, not a whole lot of security, even. The best team, or can can lose its contract and be gone the next year. The number one team in the world. If they don't have, if they, their 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 sponsorship contract is up, that team can be finished. And that wouldn't happen in a lot of other sports. Um, or or another example is like a, a team that's been around for 20 years. They can be devoted if they don't perform well enough and, and drop to drop out of the world tour. And uh, potentially lose a sponsor that's been around that for 20 years, right? So um, I think there, there are a lot of issues around that. I mean, ultimately, which is being, being talked about a lot right now, is that a league should be created, a professional cyclist league, and, um, and the value basically is creating, creating a brand and, and building on a, a league, you know, where, where all these issues are dealt with differently and there's more more security and probably hopefully more solidarity for the riders. I guess on some level, I mean, there, I guess to, to the outsider, it feels as though there is the semblance of a league. I mean, there's this incredibly rich heritage, which is as rich, if not richer, than any other professional sport on the planet. If you think about um, the Spring Classics, the Tour, the Giro, the Vuelta, the, you know, there's, there, there are these, you know, uh, um, universally accepted sort of big moments during the cycling season. Um, but hard for us again to imagine that these are actually run by distinct organizations in different kinds of ways, and the teams sort of are, um, are, are are not working in that. But I mean, it involves that sort of an in, more of an internal within the UCI and beyond, sort of reimagining what. The yeah, I, I think really all those all those different. So you have the ASO, you have the RCS, you have the UCI, you have the teams, and all that needs to be kind of integrated for um, yeah, to create more unity and uh, and also to deal deal with these issues more effectively. Where, where do you fit into this equation now? Again, post-career, yeah. um, where you, you, can, you, can, you can enjoy the aesthetics of the run around, uh, probably knowing more than the rest of us, but oh Jesus, that looks bad. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, not having to worry about it, but obviously still being concerned, but also invested and involved in, in cycling in some capacity. You talked a little bit about sort of further writing projects and things. Are these different elements that sort of imagine sort of being able to yeah, I mean, well, I, I, cycling has been a huge part of my life, and I've, uh, I've had some amazing experiences as a result, but I've also seen an incredible amount of turmoil in cycling, and uh, I've had some, some really difficult experiences, and experiences that I'd never want my children to go through or experience, and, uh, and I mean, I hope that through talking about my experience with whether, whether it was with regards to doping or um, crashing or um, just being in, in certain environments, uh, hopefully those experiences can help create uh, a better future. And I really believe that through everything that's gone on in the last six months and that this, that this um, conversation has started, this investigation has started and, and the door Much, much cleaner environment. Um, I mean, it's not 
it's not 100% clean and it never will be. I don't, I can't put a percentage on, I'll never say like, this rider's clean, this rider's clean, this rider, because I've learned through experience that you can't do that, that's not true, you know, but you can never speak with, with for, for someone else and what they've done, but um, I know from my experiences that you, that you can race clean and I've seen many of my teammates win at the highest level uh, clean as well. And, um, but I mean, we need to address these, like the safety issues that, uh, that well, all in, I mean, everything we've been talking about, you know, and, uh, and it, it'll, it will change will happen quickly. And, uh, it seems so. There's a larger sort of cloak. Yeah. Well, so it just seems so. There's a larger cloak of secrecy, whether we're talking doping, whether we're talking safety, whether we're talking all kinds of things. It's, it's best to ignore, or pretend it doesn't exist, or, or shut to the side, or whatever. Um, there's a fear around it all, and that's like a lot of, I mean, there's, in cycling, they talk about this on Maritime, where, uh, where people don't talk about it, but, I mean, there are many reasons as to why athletes, including myself, did talk about it, and it was, I mean, there was, there's a lot of fear around, yes, I, 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 I should have spoken about it, but had I spoken about it, I would have lost my job, I would have been vilified, I, there are all these fears, and, uh, Suspended and all Inside and outside. Yeah, outside. And yeah, exactly. And, and for that reason, um, athletes don't talk about it. Team, team managers don't talk about it. Team doctors don't talk. Very, very few people talk about a problem that was massive. And I would imagine it goes on in other sports. There's, you know, you, there are, uh, with, with, you know, regards to fighting and hockey, not a lot of, not a lot of players want to talk about this stuff. It, you know, it's the, it's the retired players that do speak up about it. Sure. And, uh, and athletes that are in teams are in, in that environment. Obviously, their jobs and livelihoods depend on them kind of not being vocal or rock the boat or whatever. And there are, there are many instances in cycling where guys who did speak up and they were pushed out of the sport. And, uh, and, and to really solve this problem, there needs to be um, you know, more transparency. You, you mentioned just not to I mean, just to tie, to tie to tie tie a knot on the end of this one. Um, you mentioned early on in, in LMHA, sort of riding with Steve Bauer at the '96 Olympics, which is sort of in many ways your entry point is swan song in terms of professional cycling. Um, and you sort of say, you know, sort of tells you, I'm really glad I'm giving up what I am. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of that, in a lot of ways, I mean, I just sort of, again, in terms of this larger sort of openness, transparency versus secrecy, that um, it seems to me that, I mean, cycling in the 90s, or what I remember of it, it, it almost did seem sort of like a wink, wink kind of thing. And so far as, I mean, you know, superhuman performances were, 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 were happening on a regular basis. Guys who were, you know, defying the laws of physics based on how quickly they were going up hill, given their relative size or, or, or what have you, seemed to be sort of the norm, where that sort of has, has transformed itself. But at the same time, we're seeing, you know, whether it's, whether it's full transparency or not, I, I, it seems though we can suggest that there's a great deal more transparency or more people willing to talk about it. Those retiring, but not even, I mean, it seems though that a lot of the rhetoric within the peloton has changed as well, whether it's, whether, you know, how much of it's window dressing or not, I, you know, I don't think we need to explore, but I mean, it seems though there's you know, opportunities to talk, whether it's, you know, whether it's Tyler Hamilton or whether it's people, you know, we're still racing or sort of. Yeah, and I think that they're the biggest thing in cycling and this, this doesn't go back to the 90s, it goes back to the first Tour de France. Oh, of course, you know? yeah. Right. And, uh, and it was really part of the culture. And cycling is a bloody hard sport. And um, doping has been a part of the culture in cycling for forever, really. Um, obviously, it changed with the different drugs that were introduced to the Peloton. And so we're not talking about like getting rid of EPO or getting rid of, we're talking about changing the culture. Right. And, and uh, Changing the way that basically that that whole yeah, yeah changing the culture essentially and getting rid of that culture in sport and cycling and uh, and this dialogue is changing that um, and and it will it, it's not going to it, 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 I mean yeah I mean like there's teams are teams are far less accepting of it or before they promoted it or forced it you know. Um, or forced it, you know, so. Uh, that can surely go both ways at the same time. I mean, it's, it's easier for a team to, to look the other way, but then Castigate is a, a, a rider who tests positive. 
that, I mean, I can discourage it, but I'm not really paying attention until you test positive, and then it's... Well, that's, I mean, that's part of changing the culture okay. and, and creating an environment where athletes don't feel that, where it's not an option, where they don't feel that they... Don't do this. ...have to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, um, I think in the past, teams would kind of turn a blind eye to it, and, uh, and if their rider was winning, they were okay. They, didn't, they never questioned it, um, even though everybody else around the team was thinking, like, what's going on with this thing? So, um, I don't have a segue. I mean, I've been looking for a segue for a while, but um, what is the relationship between racing and not racing bicycles? And we've talked a little bit about, um, I'd be interested, I mean, the, the nature of, uh, of a couple of our conversations preparing for today had an awful lot to do, not just with racing in your career, but also, I mean, coming back to Toronto and, oh my goodness, all these bike lanes. Um, that whether you, you're just a guy who's got bikes on the brain or whether there is, you know, a, a, a relationship here in terms of how we, and that's not to say bike racing will lead to better urban infrastructures and all kinds of things, but I'm wondering if there's sort of a, a, a growing sort of population, uh, uh, popularity around the bicycle. I mean, we're seeing it in urban centers the world over, but whether there's a relationship here or a place to talk about. Um, what are, there are different sort of species and genuses of bicycles or whether they're all part and parcel of the same technology experience, I, mentality? I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. <laughs> um, I, when I, and I'm, I'm in a, maybe a good place to talk about this right now because I've been thinking about it a whole lot. And over the last couple of years, and I knew I was going to retire um, at the end of last year. I had in 2011. I decided that I wanted to be with my family a lot more. I was I found it extremely difficult. My dad came to the Giro with with our kids and my my fam, the whole family. And uh, and when they were there, so they had made this trip, and the kids I hadn't seen the kids in. Well, I saw them three days and six weeks. So. And uh, I'd been at Perrier Bay and just all these different races and straight into the Giro. And, uh, and the kids were obviously extremely excited to see me. And we were, we spent, I think I spent two hours with them, right? And, and on the rest day, I couldn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to spend, I just I had to go training, I had to spend time with the team, I had, you know, all sorts of stuff to do, interviews or whatever. And, uh, and the kids were like absolutely crushed. And, uh, and I, they, I mean, I heard about the tantrums and all this stuff, and then I, I was just like, well, I can't do this, and it's not fair to the family, it's not, and it was heartbreaking to me because I was li missing out on a huge, uh, a huge part of their growing up, and, uh, and I really, like, I just don't want to, in 10 years, regret missing this time. And um, anyhow, so that was kind of the moment I thought this is, one more year, I was going to get. And um, so I, during that period, I reflected a lot on my career. And it's interesting because you, you I'll speak for myself, I set, these, I set these goals through my career and I achieved the goals and then moved on. And whether it was, you know, we were talking about before, provincial team, national team, and, and you just keep, you, go, you, you keep going. And now I'm looking back on all of that. And, um, and it's interesting, like, the moments I cherish the most. And I think, I, I want to talk for everybody, but a lot of my the guys that I've trained with and and, uh, and raced with over the years, they talk about the actual the moments that like the, the, the journey, not not the end result. And uh, and that journey is just time spent on the bike, riding riding in the countryside, you know, being with being with teammates, those experiences, and that's what I take from it. I mean, what my results in cycling or the races that I rode, they're secondary to the. The, the experiences I had just with, uh, you know, riding my bike, whether it was 99% of, or I won't say 99, but a huge percentage of the, the, the fondest memories are just out riding my bike, whether it was with my teammates or my dad in, in, um, in France or wherever, or riding in the city. And even like one of, a ride that I love and still do is just riding through Toronto. And, discovering the city on my bike, rediscovering the city on my bike. And I've been doing that a little bit since I've been back, and it was the same, like we would take our bikes down to Barcelona and 
ride around Barcelona and there's really no better way to see a place or see the countryside because you have the aromas, you have the, the visuals, you have the, the, uh, the sounds, the noises, everything going on around and you absorb all that work. And I mean, you can experience that walking or running, but on a bike you can see kilometers and kilometers in a short period of time. And, uh, and the commuting aspects that those experiences and, and enrich my life and I think enrich every cyclist's life. And that's why it's something that we become extremely passionate about and, and somewhat, um, yeah, I mean, entranced with or whatever. I thought there's like a, a spiritual side to it. And, uh, and, you know, like now going riding with my kids and seeing them discover it, um, it it's awesome. And, uh, and that's, that's as, you know, far more important to me than the racing. Uh, the racing is just a small aspect of what cycling is. And, uh, and I mean, whether it's the, the velodrome, um, that's going to be built and built. And I mean, this is, okay, here again, you have something that is uh, benefiting elite cycling in Canada and is a, an ideal venue to develop our Olympic athletes. But then also, this is a venue that can be great for grassroots development and not even teaching, not even like having anything to do with racing, but just teaching kids how to ride bikes in a closed environment and teaching kids how to ride bikes um, in a, yeah, a safe environment, ride them properly, instruction, and this, that is something that will benefit Ontario, Canada, and um, <coughs> like goes far beyond professional cycling or amateur cycling or whatever, but uh, when you have, so teach kids at a young age how to ride a bike properly, they'll be safe in the city, they'll be confident in the city, and overall, if we have a city of people riding bikes, it's a lot more place than a city of people in cars. And, uh, and you can see that throughout the world. And that's... This is a, a, a big feature of the Milton Bellinger I'm looking forward as well. So what, you know, Pan Am Games is great, but what do we do with it afterwards? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about sort of, again, creating opportunities for inner city kids, putting kids on bikes, um, which serve multiple purposes. Yes, getting them to exercise, but to learn how to ride safely. And to think about bicycles, whether or not they ultimately become regular cyclists or not, so having them think about a world that involves bicycles. But you also sort of mentioned that coming back to Toronto, the city's changed dramatically. Mm-hmm. How does it compare with, I mean, you sort of, we, we were also talking over lunch about how London has changed almost, yeah. not overnight, but I mean very, very yeah, quickly. Very uh, and Barcelona as well. How does Toronto compare? I, I would say Toronto's kind of at the point that those cities might have been uh, 10 years ago. Okay. And when I first moved to Spain and went into Barcelona, I, I was amazed first at the lack of cyclists. There are very, very few cyclists in the streets. And I thought, this is crazy because the the, the climate is ideal for cycling now. But then you realize that like the, the way that people were driving and the, the amount of cars, the number of cars on the road, um, made it a pretty scary environment to ride a bike in. And then very quickly, because of, I mean, Barcelona was a polluted town. It was one of the more polluted towns in, in the Western world at that time, just based on the geographical, um, well, many factors. But uh, they started implementing well, they, they developed a bike bike sharing program. They put in bike lanes. They, um, but that was just that's a small aspect of a much bigger change that happened in the city. And uh, and suddenly, I mean, you, there are tons of bikes there now. People are riding everywhere, and it's a, it's really nice to see. And um, London's similar, and uh, similar things occur. And London's not a great place to ride a bike. And, uh, and downtown London is amazing. I, I went there several times with my dad when, you know, like when I was younger, and it was horrendous. It was just like you couldn't cross the city without being in a traffic jam. Like you, you would know, right? Yeah, it was sure. like you know, brutal. Yeah. And now downtown London is incredible. It's just awesome. It's so easy to, to get around, and uh, and that, that happened pretty quickly. And in Toronto now, I mean, I come back and I'm just astonished at the number of cars and the traffic jams and uh, and just the overall and just craziness of it, and, uh, and something needs to be done because it's getting to a point where it's not that livable. Uh, there's, there, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact estimate, but I'm, the population is going to continue to grow, and uh, something needs to be done. And cycling is a great solution. I mean, first of all, it benefits the health of the, the, health of the population on 
speaking for myself, and I can guess as to what other athletes think. I mean, I, I, I read some studies where most athletes, you know, don't think long term. They think about the result in the next month, two months, year, or whatever. And uh, and I mean, that's it's, it's it's similar to when you look at these extreme sports where where the athletes are willing to take massive risks that they know, you know. They could die in a second, but they're willing to take those risks because they're not thinking. They're not thinking long term. You're just embracing the moment, and it, it's somewhat similar in that sense. And um, and I mean, I was I was scared of the side effects, um, and and that's why I was somewhat. I guess like I was cautious as to how much uh, I use. I was also felt guilty, and uh, and I was paranoid. So. It's just like the cross section of society. Some people are willing to take far more risk than others, and some some are willing to take no risk at all. And, uh, and I mean, it's really similar to that. Like you get people in society that are just willing to, to do anything, and they don't think long term at all, and, and they survive. And, uh, and others don't take the risk.
Patrick's like, uh, same thing. You told me, okay, the break's going to go now. Like, I want you to you know, follow these attacks. And, and, um, and I mean, he was, he was bang on every time. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's I've raised with other guys who have been, obviously, extremely tactically astute, too. Uh, just paid attention to all the details. Um, but, and, and the guys who are, like, completely oblivious to it. They're just, like, horrendous at tactics. But, uh, but I mean, he, Steve taught me some, some, some valuable lessons in those few weeks that we spent together racing. And, uh, and, and things that I, you know, I, I, I thought about through my whole career. Other questions?
for the for the better and for the worse. So I mean, one of the fascinating things about or one of the things about bike races is how many different aspects there are to a particular race. And you talked about how how uh, captivated you were by races as a child. And I wonder I know there haven't been very many races since you retired, but when you watch races now, are are you still that child or what are the parts of the race that get your heart pounding or um, get most excited about it? I mean, I still get excited when I watch bike races, but it's not the same as when I was a child at all. And there was, uh, I don't know, I mean, there was a point where I saw the realities of cycling, and there's also, there, there was, I, I mean, when you understand, when you've been in that milieu, where like in the middle of it all, and you know the characters and all that, it kind of takes away a bit of the intrigue, and the, you know? And now, now I get excited, because I'm watching guys that I know or I get excited for them. And, uh, but it, I still love watching cycling. And, you know, the other day I watched a movie about Bradley Wiggins and just watching that, I wanted to go ride my bike right <laughs> after, you know? And so I still have, it's still like these, the films and the, the races, they do evoke that, evoke that like passion and, and desire to ride my bike. But it's not, it's not the same kind of sort of idolatry or whatever this like I I really I, I don't um, I don't know before it was something intangible that I wanted to get towards you know and then and then I so so there was this whole dream involved and stuff that I imagined went on that I didn't know about and then when you learn all about that you know like I don't know you know what the team does after the race and things like that like the, <laughs> the imagination aspects kind of are gone and so I see the race in a different different way than I used to. Um, and I would say, I don't, I, it's not, I, I guess it's not, it's not as enjoyable for me as it once was, but on another level, it's, uh, it's just, it's as fulfilling, you know, I don't know if that makes sense. But. <laughs>